So, you're on the fence about buying the Canon R5. You've probably seen some videos online saying it overheats or it's a piece of crap, but are those people right or do they just not know how to use their camera? Today we are going to do a series of tests to finally decide is the Canon R5 worth buying? Let's get into it. If you've ever showed up to a photo shoot without a battery or a memory card in your camera, go ahead and click that like button right now and let's get into the testing. It's been six months since I made a video. You'd think I'm like dying or sick, but I'm just retired in Hawaii. Oh, 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 oh my God, I love my job. Today's video is all about whether the Canon R5 is worth your money or not. There are so many conflicting opinions about this camera online, that it's the best camera in the world, or it is absolutely horrible because all it does is overheat. And so today we're gonna get to the bottom of this. We're gonna go through my testing, my rigorous testing when it comes to getting a new camera, if it will become my everyday camera or not. So as a point of comparison, I will be comparing this camera to the Canon EOS R, which I think a lot of people will be upgrading to this camera from. And then the 1DX Mark II, which is a five year old beast of a Canon camera that I consider the best camera Canon ever made. So what is it that I'm actually testing for when I'm looking for my new everyday camera? I'll read it to you so that you can follow along. Number one is a solid and cinematic image with great color and sharpness. I think everyone wants that. Secondly, quick and reliable autofocus, similar to what I experienced using the 1DX Mark II, which if you're not aware, is arguably the best autofocus in any camera in the entire world. Fight me if you disagree, it is perfect. Third, I personally need the ability to shoot in 120 frames a second, slow motion. Regardless of resolution, it's just gotta look good. Fourth, it also has to be a stills camera. So in addition to shooting great video, it has to be able to capture professional level photographs. It also has to have the flexibility to allow me to shoot in reasonably low light shooting conditions. And then finally, and most importantly, I need a camera that does not get in my way, which means if I capture an incredible photo, if I capture an incredible video, is it in focus? Was there overheating issues or did for some reason it not save to the camera? Can the camera screw me? Even if I do my job perfectly, can the camera get in the way? And that's, that's what I look for. It's a decent set of things that it needs to pass, but when you're paying almost $4,000 for a camera with no lens, you, you want these features and you deserve these features. Okay, test number one. How good is the image quality at 4K and 8K resolutions? Is it noticeably better than say the Canon EOS R? First off, the 4K and 8K is absolutely incredible. So let me just get that off your mind. But the Canon EOS R shouldn't even be allowed to be called a 4K camera because this is 4K on the R5 and this is 4K on the same lens at the same distance on the R. It was unusable for most professional applications. Now, I didn't know I'd be telling you this, but the 4K high quality on the R5 beat the crap out of the 4K on the 1DX Mark II even. Yes, 4K high quality on this camera is the best I've seen out of Canon ever. This is what it looks like, but this camera is phenomenal. And with the flat picture profile, which we'll get into in a second, 4K high quality, you're gonna wanna use it for everything. Now, the more astute viewers just caught that and said, wait, you said you're gonna wanna use 4K for everything. What about the 8K? It's an 8K camera. One minute, 60 seconds of the 8K RAW is over 20 gigabytes. Let me just be very clear. The 8K RAW is absolutely incredible, except for it's so big that I don't even think I can afford to shoot YouTube videos on it and try to store them. It's massive, but it's beautiful. The last thing I'll touch on about 8K is, while 8K seems attractive for most people to just shoot their videos in and seem really professional, 8K is actually used for visual effects and things where you need bigger plates to be able to zoom in uh, and move things around. So 8K in that application on this camera looks incredible, but you will not be shooting your entire YouTube videos in 8K. And if you think you will, 
I, I, wish, I wish you luck. The second test I absolutely had to try was the flat picture profile. Does using it give you a more cinematic image or more stops of dynamic range? In short, I will never, ever, 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 ever again shoot in standard mode. Flat picture profile is my jam. I ran a few tests just to illustrate this to you. This is what it looks like flat. This is what it looks like standard. But this is what flat looks like when colored and this is what it looks like standard. As you can see, in terms of a cinematic image, the flat picture profile gives you so much more flexibility and options when coloring your video that you can actually make it feel like a film rather than just make it look like real life. Notice standard is still absolutely beautiful, but it, there's nothing movie-ish about it. It just looks like real life. The flat picture profile gave me the option to be able to grade my footage as if it was a short film, and I really enjoyed it and I think most of you will as well. Now this next test is literally the most important to me, it is the autofocus test. Is the R5 able to keep up to something like the 1DX Mark II? A lot of people undervalue how important autofocus is. Myself and every other 1DX Mark II user out there has been spoiled for years. The autofocus, as I'm showing you right now, on a 1DX is butter. It is perfectly smooth, it keeps everything in focus, it's extremely fast, and it's effortless. But unfortunately because of this, I have been unhappy with every single camera I have ever used since the 1DX. And that included the EOS R5 for the first month and a half I used it. And then I started messing with settings, started messing with features, different lens choices, and while I was not, I repeat, I was not able to get the autofocus on the R5 to be as good as the 1DX, I was able to get it just behind. As you can see here, this is all footage from the R5. It, it's a little jerky, but for the most part, everything stays in focus. While I can genuinely tell you the autofocus on the R5 is good, it is passable even for me, and no one will notice anything except for 1DX users. The question really then becomes Canon. This is for Canon. Why is the 1DX Mark II so good? And is it possible to recreate it in the mirrorless body? But I did all sorts of autofocus tests with the R5 and I was really quite impressed. I thought it was going to be a lot worse than it was. Actually, the entire time I was shooting, I kept complaining. I thought things were out of focus, but actually it was just fine. It was, it's just behind the 1DX Mark II. So it's a pass, pass for me. Test four, are the still images noticeably better than say a 1DX Mark II, considering this camera has almost twice the megapixels coming in at like 46 or 48 megapixels. This one is gonna piss off a lot of people, but no. No, and I'm just as shocked as you. I know you're gonna say, what are you talking about? There has to be. It's got double the megapixel. I'm just as shocked as you. This is captured on my 1DX Mark II. This is captured on the R5, both with the exact same lenses at the exact same settings. And if I switch them around on the screen, you would have absolutely zero clue which is which. But regardless, as soon as you upload them to Instagram and they get compressed, they're, they, you literally cannot tell them apart with a magnifying glass. Test five I probably cared about more than anything, including autofocus, and that was, does the 4K 120 frames a second look noticeably better than the 120 frames a second that we got in 1080p on the 1DX? The results we got from the test at first seemed to not really show a huge difference. They looked almost identical. The color the same, they flowed and moved the same, and then we noticed the difference. The Canon R5 actually does have noticeably better 120 frames over the 1DX. Is it immediately noticeable? No. The subject itself, whether it be the face of someone or the texture of something you're showing in slow motion, is razor sharp in 4K, and in 1080 it's just not there. It's not the same sharpness. Test six is the one that you've all secretly been sitting there dreading, and that is the overheating issue. Is it real? 
and will it affect you? Yes, this camera overheats a lot. I actually just had to pause mine while recording this video because I'd gone like 40 minutes in and I had overheated. Now, will overheating affect everyone? No, actually. Frono's Photos covered this quite decently two weeks ago, but Canon has been coming out with new firmware updates that actually are extending our recording times before it overheats, and they've been doubling. Will the overheating affect you? Here's the, here's the honest truth. If you're a studio photographer or videographer and you can shoot in air-conditioned studios or you have time to shoot what you need, no. You'll be able to shoot and let it cool down for a few minutes like I do. You'll be absolutely fine. Unless you are someone like a travel photographer or a vlogger who could miss a moment because their camera has shut down. If that is the case, yes, this camera will actually be affecting your workflow. There were times in my daily vlogging career where I would be on paid sponsored trips and I'd only have 20 or 30 minutes in each location to capture all the content I needed. If I had been shooting on this camera, there's a very good chance that I would have missed a few of those locations and gotten in a lot of trouble. It's also really worth noting that the only thing that really overheats this camera is 8K, which would overheat any camera, 4K high quality, which is 8K down sampled, which would overheat any camera, and 4K 120. Now, all that being said, I'm really looking forward to the new firmware updates as Canon has them, that'll be able to allow me to push the boundaries of this camera, but I can honestly tell you that I feel comfortable telling you this camera will not really affect you unless you are a professional travel photographer or a vlogger. Test number seven, how does the camera run with EF lenses? While it is a native RF mount lens, how does it run with Canon EF lenses, which I sure have a ton of? And the answer to that is if you couldn't tell this entire video, which cameras were being shot on which lenses, then there's absolutely no issue. I didn't see an issue personally, and you obviously, if you couldn't tell, you didn't see an issue personally either, because I shot on RF and EF lenses on this camera for the entire video. Test number eight deals with IBIS, or in-body image stabilization, and is it actually even usable? Is it something you should care about? I personally have never used image stabilization before in my life. I find it to kind of give these micro jitters. So I wasn't really looking for it to work great in this camera either. Um, lo and behold, it, it does still have jitters. Image stabilization from my understanding is actually primarily designed for photography so that your image is razor sharp. It's not meant to be a glide cam. So is the image stabilization usable? Yeah, for small minor movements and tiny little motions, yes. For bigger things or actually trying to use it as a gimbal or uh, like a glide cam, no. It, it hurts rather than helps. Also, if you use this camera on a gimbal or glide cam, make sure you turn all image stabilization off. Just a rule of thumb, you don't want digital image stabilization and a real stabilizer. It messes with the camera's brain. Test number nine comes at the request of a few of my friends on Instagram, and it's, does the R5 perform decently well in low light? Usually cameras with more megapixels are a lot grainier and look worse in low light. But much to my surprise, when tested against the 1DX Mark II, this camera actually did very, very well in low light. Can you shoot on this camera in a dark room with just a lighter? Yes, absolutely. Anything darker than that, I'm not quite sure what you're shooting, but um, test it and let me know. Before I give you the final thoughts, final if I would buy this camera, I just wanna thank you guys for watching. If you enjoy these videos, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I'm gonna be making these hopefully every single week again, so I'd love to have you here. Our final closing thoughts. Would I recommend this camera to a friend? Yeah, 100% absolutely. If they can afford this camera and they don't currently have a 1DX Mark II or a 1DX3, yes, 100%, I would, I would push them and tell them this is the camera they need to buy. Would I buy this camera myself? I cannot believe I'm saying this and I, I'm, I, I just can't believe I'm about to say this. This camera, even though the autofocus is just a step behind the 1DX, 
has won me over from my 1DX Mark II. This will be my new primary camera. And for all paid shoots, jobs where I only have so many hours to capture something from someone else who has paid me to be there, I will still take this camera as my A camera, but I will continue to carry my 1DX in my bag for when this camera inevitably overheats, because it will, so that I can switch to another camera and keep trucking forward without having to wait for it to cool down. It looks incredible. I didn't think it would. I didn't really want to believe it would, and it does. So Canon, way to go. The image quality looks incredible. Just figure out the overheating, get some focus things under control. And other than that, I love you guys very much. I hope you enjoy your new camera and I'll see you next time. Peace. Oh, by the way, we're reviewing the R6 next week. So if you're on the fence, maybe wait.